Jogjakarta, the geographic and cultural center of the island of Java, is centrally located in the Indonesian archipelago. Enjoying special provincial autonomy from the federal government, Joja is the capital of the special region of Jogjakarta. Home to over 3.5 million people, Jogjakarta is the second smallest province geographically, with an area just over 3,000 kilometers. In the north, Jogjakarta is bordered by Mount Merapi, the most active volcano in Indonesia, and to the south lie a series of beautiful beaches. Within Joja's borders are the renowned temples Borobudur and Prambanan. Its rich history and vibrant art scene make Jogjakarta a must-see while visiting Indonesia. Hello, Nama Saya Brian Mai, Saya Dari Iowa, America Sirika. Saya Mahasiswa di University of Iowa. Saya Belajar Bahasa Indonesia di Universitas Sanata Dharma di Jogjakarta. Saya juga relawan di Keraton, Jogjakarta. Nama saya Mika Inadomi. Saya dari Seattle, Washington. Di Amerika, saya mahasiswa di Universitas Johns Hopkins. Jurusan saya adalah ilmu politik dan matematikas. Saya juga relawan di Keraton dengan Mas Brian. We're working with Tepes Tanda Yakti, the Information and Communication Office of the Keraton. We are with the U.S. Indonesia Society's Summer Studies Program to learn Bahasa Indonesia at Sanada Dharma University and experience Indonesian culture. Sultan Hamengku Buwono IX, who lived from 1912 to 1988, was one of the most important and influential sultans in Jogjakarta's history. He was said to have resembled a sphinx, quote, he is usually quiet but has charisma. As a long-standing national level leader, he has the affections of the public but always maintains his integrity. His lifetime spans significant portions of Indonesian history, including the Dutch colonial rule, the Japanese occupation, Indonesia's struggle for independence, the intense nationalism of Sukarno's years, and the establishment of Suharto's new order. Due to the Dutch occupation, the ninth Sultan was educated in the Netherlands. Traditionally, at this time, Sultans were able to choose between two courses of study. The first course took four years and predominantly led to a law degree. One would study comparative ethnology of the East Indies, tropical economics, statistics, Javanese language, Islam, archaeology, history of the Indies, and colonial history. The other course is called Indology. It took five years to complete and focused on economics and language. Some additional subjects that were focused on with this course included political science, constitutional law, customary law, and archaeology. They would study at Leiden University. It was the most distinguished institution in the world for the time, specializing in instruction about the East Indies. The Keratin is more than just a palace. It is the acting provincial capital of the special region of Jogjakarta. This is why there was a one kilometer square wall surrounding the palace grounds. There are two main gates in this wall, with another five smaller gates that can be found as well. Upon walking into the Keratons grounds, visitors will soon notice the Joglo-style architecture of many of the buildings. Joglo, traditional Javanese architecture, can be recognized by its pyramid or trapezium-shaped roofs with pillars used as support. Here, in the Keraton, the color gold represents the Sultan. This is why gold can be found on almost every building in the Keraton. All of this is fairly obvious, however only the observant will notice the blend of traditional Javanese culture, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism that is represented throughout the Keraton. video, we decided to interview some of our fellow Usindo participants about their perspectives of the Keraton and Jogjakarta in general. First, we have quotes from Adam Murphy. We began the interview by asking Adam what his perception of the Keraton was before and after we had a discussion with the fourth princess of Jogjakarta, Gusti Hayu. He said, quote, Before the discussion with the princess, the Keraton seemed like a ceremonial idea with grandiose procedures and elaborate dress, with less function in modern politics. 
I was aware that the Sultan managed simultaneously as the Sultan and the Governor for the province. Meeting the princess humanized the role of the Sultan and the royal family. It showed that they are people too. They are born into a role that culturally and legally gives them legitimacy in this region. Meeting the princess gave some background and depth to what I knew about the Sultan and his family. We then asked Adam to describe the values that he's witnessed in Jogjakarta throughout the two and a half months that he's been here. He said, quote, I've learned that there is a diverse mix of culture here. There is also a mix of people who appreciate the cultural history of Jogjakarta. There are other people who care less about their Javanese heritage and more about national pride. I've observed these qualities in generations of people who speak Javanese and often express dissatisfaction that the younger generations did not speak it. I have seen in the people I spent most of my time with the value of education. Many people in Jogjakarta are kind and eager to learn about where I'm from and why I am here in Jogjakarta. We then asked if, in his opinion, Jogjakarta would welcome and accept a female as their next sultan. Adam said, I think many men in this society and several women believe that a woman cannot be sultan. They oftentimes use tradition as a way to justify their answer, which I believe is based on maintaining the patriarchy. We then asked Yusindo participant Gibson Haynes the same question, to which he responded, I've seen a wide variety of beliefs, and the only thing I can be sure of is that there wouldn't be unanimous support for and respect of a female sultan but there would probably be a better chance if the Sultan abdicated and she, meaning the current crown princess, were formally crowned when he was alive. In a discussion with Yusindo students, Princess Gusti Hayu explained her approach to leading her office. She is unconventional in the sense that she pushes for collaboration and likes to be challenged and to hear ideas from her staff, even if they are below her in rank. When asked to comment on her leadership style, Gibson said, quote, I think a collaborative style is much more productive and likely to produce innovative results than a single top-down structure. Another Yusindo participant, Emily Wood, commented, I really respect the princess for changing the system and creating a more collaborative department because there is so much to be gained from collaboration. Not only are there different points of view, there are different options, backgrounds, and suggestions, and I believe it creates a better community and more respect all around because no one is considered better than the other. The Sultan occupies his position as the Sultan itself, as well as the governor of the region of Jogjakarta. Each title comes with different regulations and protocols with respect to having direct interaction with the people of Joja. More specifically, the governor position operates under a more strict bureaucracy, whereas the sultan position allows for him to speak with civilians more candidly and openly. Adam commented on this structure, saying, quote, In general, I think it is important for the people to have a line of communication with the government. From the discussion with the princess, it sounded like he enjoyed talking with his subjects until early in the morning. Since his role as sultan is intertwined with governor, people can access him as either. Gibson proceeded to compare this system with that in the U.S., saying, I think in the U.S. that not requiring congressional officials to hold public meetings regularly is a shame and should be fixed, but there is already more opportunity for civilians in the U.S. to interact with their officials than in Georgia. The Keraton is currently trying to balance tradition with modernization and seeks to devise a strategy to incorporate Panchasila as the national Indonesian government becomes a stronger democracy. When asked how she views the future of Jogjakarta doing so, Emily Wood commented, I think Joja will continue to hold on to its rich cultural heritage, just like it has in the past. Just because modernization may be happening more quickly doesn't mean that the city will lose its traditional values, because they play such a huge role in the identity of the city and its people. I think that the people are able to adapt to modernization, to fit their values and cultures, because the culture was there first and is so strong, rather than the other way around. Gibson then said, people will feel less need to retreat into fundamentalism if they are more assured that the rising tide of modernization will lift their boat too.